Hello and welcome everyone to the beginning of our second week of Designing for Empathy workshops in conjunction with the Designing for Empathy Summit that starts officially later this week. We hope that you will be able to join us for that as well. My name is Greg Stevens and it is my pleasure to be your moderator for today's workshop and to be joined by some lovely colleagues, Elif Goxigdem, who will I who I will welcome in just a moment. And of course, Anne Fullenkamp, who is the star of our show today. So uh, Anne, thank you so much for being here. Before we start our program officially, I do want to let everyone know that this program is being recorded and we do have closed captioning transcripts available for you should you need that service. And I also want to take this opportunity to provide land acknowledgements. I happen to be calling in from New York City, and as such, I humbly acknowledge that New York City is located in ancestral Lenape homelands, and we recognize the longstanding significance of these lands for Lenape peoples past and present. And Ali, if I know that you are in Washington, D.C., and the city of Washington, D.C., resides on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Anacostan peoples and neighbors the ancestral lands of the Piscataway and Palmenque peoples. And Anne, I know that you are in Pittsburgh, which occupies the ancestral lands of the Adena culture, Hopal culture, and Monadhegala people, who were later joined by refugees from other tribes driven from their homelands by colonizers. We honor these traditional native inhabitants of these places and uplift their historic, unique, and enduring relationship with their lands, which is their ancestral territory. So thank you for allowing me that moment to provide a land acknowledgement. And with that, I officially welcome you and introduce you to my friend and colleague, Alif Goxigdem. Alif, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for the introduction. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, and um, as I have been doing with all of our workshops, I would like to take this opportunity to provide a, just a quick uh, background on uh, what is designing for empathy, what is designing for empathy workshop, uh, basically why are we doing this, and, and I'm really, really excited about the second part of uh, uh, Anne's uh, workshop today. Uh, because the first one we did last week was uh, truly inspirational and I think everyone at that workshop left with uh, many ideas and inspirations and and uh, and we understand that it's uh, difficult to you know bring everybody back you know consistently but uh, uh, since we are having this you know recorded hopefully it'll also help uh, those who are not here today uh, to catch up and um, join in the conversation so uh, our main goal with the Designing for Empathy workshops and summits is to create a platform where individuals from different backgrounds, disciplines, and sectors can come together to develop solutions to the empathy deficit in our world. We believe that our ability to develop individuals' capacity for empathy towards the oneness of all beings, all of humanity, the environment, and the planet, lies at the heart of our ability to solve of our, solve our uh, most pressing uh, problems. The challenges we face today from social injustice to climate change are not because we lack the intellectual capacity, technologies or the resources to tackle them, but it is because caring for others as much as we care for ourselves, as if that other could also be me, which makes us want to take action to solve another's suffering requires a major perspective shift. This is where we stop seeing ourselves as the centers of the universe and start recognizing that we are all interconnected parts of something much greater than ourselves. This pragmatic perspective shift from I to all can only be achieved through a lived experience and empathy, our ability to imagine the world through another's perspective provides the foundation. Something extraordinary happens when we empathize. Uh, because of our inherent ability uh, to empathize, our ego, which always puts I, me, myself in the front and center, gets distracted momentarily, while our true self, which is deeply rooted in our heart in the qualities of love and compassion, takes the helm of our attention and channels it and immerses it in another's perspective. 
this is by no way a scientific explanation of what empathy is. I just wanted to share uh, uh, my own reflections on how I feel uh, when I empathize. This is not always easy because it requires us to look at the world in a whole new way. Instead of placing ourselves in the center of the universe, we realize that we are in each being in the circle of oneness is unique and an essential component of our existence. This transformational shift in the way we perceive our world can only happen through an experience. And that's where designing for empathy comes in. We believe that because empathy can be best learned through lived experiences, creating those authentic experiences where individuals can discover, unlock and advance their potential for empathy in safe and non-judgmental spaces become more essential. Designing for Empathy workshops are here to provide a platform uh, for a diverse group of individuals uh, to come together and experiment with the creation of these perspective shifting experiences that lead to a spark of empathy on a journey towards a realization of oneness and interconnectedness of all beings. Thank you so much for being here again. And um, with that, I would like to introduce again uh, Anne Fullenkamp from uh, Pittsburgh Children's Museum. Uh, one of our generous sponsors. And thank you again for uh, your leadership and uh, for facilitating this workshop uh, second time in a row and looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, so today we are going to uh, look at our exhibit XOXO and specifically a activity that came out of that exhibit XOXO that we're looking um, to think about and experiment in new ways as a potential tool for, um, for all learners for in museum settings and other informal learning settings. So um, I think a little background on me personally and, uh, and then a lead into what our project is. Uh, I've been um, at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh now for 15 years. Um, I'm, I'm an exhibit designer and I oversee our projects that uh, develop traveling exhibits. So a lot of the work we do at the Children's Museum is um, for our audiences, but we're really focused on how to extend that impact. And we, one of the ways we do that is through our traveling exhibits. So in 2014, we were approached by a funder, the Fetzer Institute, who wanted to create an exhibit about love and forgiveness. And it was very interesting, very challenging because their only brief was creating an exhibit for children about love and forgiveness. So you can imagine that was a very, that's a very broad task, uh, very little context um, other than making it playful and making it accessible uh, for all ages. So in, our development process, it was, it was very interesting because you, you can imagine the discussions about what is love and what is forgiveness and how you could actually bring that back to a traveling exhibit for a family who might be dropping in without any context or intention of coming to an exhibit that might provoke some, some big questions or some big emotions. So um, at the end of the day, the exhibit at its core became about communication. We found that um, being able to practice communication skills in a museum setting with families, in school groups, um, peer to peer with young people, with children themselves was the way that we could take this big topic that is, um, is vast and uh, does not have a, <laughs> an ending in terms of a, um, uh, an outcome and a solution. The, the ideas of love and forgiveness go on and on uh, forever. But if we could, at its core, um, have our visitors leave the experience having gained um, some insight and some practical tools that they can continue, for us that that would have been that is the big success. So what I'm going to do today is um, walk us through some of the uh, activities in love and forgiveness, and and how we did um, our approach to this uh, topic, and then. Um, like to, to take a, a break and practice an activity. Um, one of the activities from the exhibit, it's our story puzzle that we've been thinking about a lot in new ways. And um, 
love to have a little time with this group to, to practice, um, play the puzzle and, and look at some ways that this puzzle can be used um, in other contexts or as a tool for uh, communicating about empathy and emotions. And um, the other idea that uh, become really interested in, frankly, through um, this group designing uh, for empathy over the last couple of months is um, how this tool can really be used in um, a professional development setting and um, could be used for lots of different topics. So with that, I will begin to share my screen. And here we go. So design for empathy, that's where we are today. So a little background on the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. Um, our mission is to provide innovative experiences that inspire kindness, joy, creativity, and curiosity. And so I want to point out kindness because this is a, a change, an addition that we made to our mission statement um, during COVID and during the pandemic. We were closed, like many, most museums, we closed in March of 2020, and um, we actually were did not open again until June of 2021. We took that extra time to make changes in our physical museum and look at exhibits differently, but we also took that time to really reevaluate our mission statement because one of the things that struck us was that um, museums, at least in our community, were categorized as a non-essential service. So we were on the keep closed list for a very long time. But we came to realize, and I think um, it's, pardon my cat, um, that there will be, um, that, that this extended quarantine has really disrupted um, social norms and how people communicate with one another and interact with one another, and especially for children's and children and families. And so we were thinking about how and why a children's museum actually is an essential service. Um, and one of those key reasons is that idea of kindness and that we wanted to reopen. We were already doing this work in social emotional learning, but we wanted to make it very clear that we believe that kindness is um, paramount importance to the work we do. So we, we added it to our mission statement and um, with our programs and exhibits and our general um, activities moving forward, we have kindness at the forefront. So um, at the foundation of who the Children's Museum is, is our philosophy of uh, playing with real stuff. And this actually goes back to those ideas that were <laughs> reinforced when we were closed, this idea of authentic experiences, real experiences, and tactile in-person experiences. So we think real, um, play with real stuff applies to materials, tools, and processes. It's a great way to learn and know um, if you're interested in in a topic, in a task, in a skill, getting your hands literally dirty and understanding the real tools is a key to, to um, exploring those, um, those skills. And um, access to authentic and inspiring experiences, in-person experiences, whether as a group or an individual experience of looking at art, um, listening to music, trying something for the first time, having um, an interaction with a stranger in, in a surprising, joyful way through play. These are all authentic, real experiences. And um, this also applies to how we physically build our exhibits. Having exhibits that are highly responsive, um, very robust and sturdy and sustainable. This has this idea of um, sustainability and responsiveness is this idea that human beings, people in person are affecting and changing and contributing to um, a museum experience in a real way. So this is these are our guiding principles that we took into our planning of XOXO. And uh, with this exhibit, we have these three primary goals to encourage meaningful experiences and conversations about love and forgiveness. And again, it goes to that root of authenticity and responsiveness. We wanted to gain insight into the various ways people express feelings. So this will go to how in this exhibit, it was really critical um, 
for the audience to be active participants because they were actually contributing to the content of the exhibit and to make visitors aware that they have control over how they choose to respond to those feelings. So when we started this exhibit, obviously we're a children's museum and we focus on um, early learners and families. And in that period of, of time when, you, when children are growing up and frankly, young parents or new parents are learning how to interact with their children, a lot of this has to do with emotions and understanding that um, you control your emotions and your emotions don't control you. And so that was the other part of our um, decision-making when we looked at communication as a tool, we wanted to give not only children, but also the adults some um, skills so that they could continue these conversations when they left the museum. So I mentioned that XOXO really relies on audience participation for its content. This at the time we made this decision was actually quite risky um, because we left a lot of things open-ended to the point of we really weren't sure um, what was going to happen if the visitors didn't actively participate. So a lot of our design decisions had, um, had to do with how do we um, encourage participation to the point that they would, um, we would get meaningful content. So how do you get people to participate and get a good result? That was the other big question mark when we took this risk and, and left things open-ended. In one, on one hand, we might guarantee or have ways that people would participate, but how did we know they would actually talk about love and forgiveness? So a lot of our, when we start going through some of the details, you'll see some um, how we approach that. And a lot of it had to do with um, this idea of giving starters and prompts and um, visual and um, verbal uh, vocabulary. So we focused on how people communicate. You communicate with your voice, with your face, and with your words in writing and um, or through drawing. And you can see here, we were really focused on all ages. Um, we were really aware that children, we often call them pre-literate, that they might not have all the writing skills, but this was a chance to introduce new vocabulary and practice those skills. Um, we all, uh, most people are comfortable using their voice, even at the very early ages, you're, you begin to vocalize. Um, and the same way with faces. I mean, from the time we're born, we're, we're communicating with our faces and with sound. So we kind of left it at those fundamental um, ways of expression because it also was the most universal. So, <laughs> This is where when we talk about children and asking them to write or read or even participate actively in um, an activity, we really need the adults to be active participants. And we wanted an exhibit about love and forgiveness to really engage the adults with the children rather than having the children just run in and play. Like they might in a gross motor skill activity, like at a park or if you have a slide, it's okay for the kids to learn that agency and that independence. And we have some of that here too, but we really wanted the parents to um, want to be involved and participate as well. So um, this is going to be a series of some of the activities that we focused on. Um, the first is our silhouettes activity, and this is about communicating with our faces. So at the core of this activity, you sit, um, two people sit opposite, each, uh, opposite of each other, one person is the artist, the person who's drawing, and the other person is the subject. And they have to sit very still. And um, when you sit in front of the light box, you can see there's a um, your profile is in shadow. And then the other person just has to trace your profile. So at the end of the day, this really isn't about the product or an art activity. It's about getting two people to sit opposite each other, opposite each other and notice one another, um, communicate, with what the other person needs. So one person has to be very still and respectful. The other person is looking at um, their friend, their partner very carefully. So it was just this kind of quiet moment 
um, it was a it was a really surprising um, activity is how many conversations started to happen. We had some very simple prompts in front of them in this um, and it was really these questions about noticing what do you notice about the other person but it became this very kind of sweet moment where two people would sit across from each other and look at each other very carefully. Um, the dynamic was different, whether it was a parent and child, they were related. Um, when two children did it, it was also very sweet because they would start communicating with each other and then even learning um, how to talk to one another to, to get the results you want. And then it's, you start in these subtle ways, start thinking about how our words and how we say our words can, um, can affect an outcome and how you're perceived to one another. The other part of this activity is we had a display wall to, um, so when you draw your silhouette, you can post it on the wall, but at the end of the day, this really wasn't about um, the product or the artwork. At the core, it was just having this moment together. So another activity we had are our tone phones, and this is about communicating with our voices. So in this activity, you would, we had a pair of telephones and you would, it's old fashioned like um, telephone with a handset. You pick up the telephone and you vocalize into it. You can say specific words, you can blow into it, but the effect is that your words, your vocalizations are projected onto a large screen and the tone of your voice affects the visual outcome. So a harsh, loud tone, will result in a sharp, jagged forms, sweet, soft tones resulted in a visual equivalent of soft, small, floating um, forms. So we wanted to, in this activity, we were making that connection between how you say your words. It's not just the words you're saying, but it's how you're saying it because the system, the program, our software, isn't listening or understanding the specific words, but it is picking up the tone of your voice. And um, often that is so key when we're talking about love, forgiveness, empathy, emotions, how we're talking with one another. It really is often not what you're saying, but how you're saying it. So this was an amazing visualization of that. And it was um, an opportunity for adults to talk to children about tone of voice because Again, for early learners, that is a, a big signal. That's when um, you start to understand um, what tone of voice means. And for parents too, frankly, it could be a wake up call for them too, to um, be aware that they might not know how they're sounding when they're talking to their children or even to each other that how you're heard by others has an effect on, on um, how it's perceived and it can, trigger some really strong emotions in, in um, different people. So this was a great way to, um, to see that in a very fun and playful way. <laughs> playful way. So another activity we had are our quote, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> our quote mirrors. And this is where you're communicating with your words and your faces. <coughs> so one thing we absolutely knew is that people love to look at themselves in the, in the mirror. So we use mirrors as a device throughout the exhibit um, to create this idea of reflection. Um, and also when people would stop at a mirror, they, we put words and signs on mirrors because um, there was a lot of content we wanted to convey, but we know sometimes that people see signs and they kind of go, um, they disregard or they don't pick up all the information, but we knew people always like to stop or uh, catch a glimpse of, the, of themselves. Um, so by putting some of these quotes from um, about love and forgiveness from inspirational people, it was a way for, um, for us to, to take a moment and people tended to spend more time at these signs and read and then reflect on what was being said. Now we actually developed this before Instagram was a big deal. It's hard to imagine way back in 2013 <laughs> when we were developing this, um, we weren't considering Instagram. We thought some people would take pictures but certainly not what it became. So as the exhibit has continued to travel, these have been those Instagrammable moments. And you can see 
um, from the picture uh, with the family, the, the dad with his two sons, that th this is what we're seeing more and more. And we love this because it becomes a keepsake. It's something they want to remember. And um, they're taking these pictures in front of these quotes because um, they think it's significant. So we took this idea and turned it into an interactive um, activity too. Again, this idea of making things playful, uh, especially when you want people to pay attention to some tough topics that you can have some fun and, and um, that moment of discovery. So these were the same idea with the mirror, but the um, messages were hidden. So you needed to touch um, the paddles that have the prints of your hands in order to turn a light on and then the message and the quote was revealed. So these are these are these cool two-way mirrors that we've been playing with. And um, so you can see that uh, some of the mirrors, when you hold hands, it's activated too. So what we did was with the larger one, we spaced the paddles just far apart that for most people you needed to hold someone's hand to complete the circuit to turn on the light. So again, this idea of togetherness, communicating with one another, um, I have to say this is definitely in a in a pre-COVID pandemic world, this idea of holding hands to activate it and, and actually at the time too, and hopefully maybe one day we'll get to this, having strangers hold hands um, to, to turn on the mirror and have this surprise message come. And then re people often read these messages together. So again, this idea of uh, simple messages, having the mirrors where people are kind of forced or encouraged to look at themselves while they're reading it too had an impactful um, effect that uh, sometimes when you're just that self-reflection, it's not about vanity, but it's just about kind of looking at yourself too and, and your face when you're saying these things and just understanding more and being more connected to your emotions and, and how um, your emotions are reflected out into the world. So with love and forgiveness, the whole exhibit was really based on these, uh, the dichotomy. You have the, the positive and the negative. So every time we had a positive message, we needed to balance it with a negative and vice versa. So um, this activity was a challenge. It's called Release the Negative. And what we did is it was, you wrote down a negative feeling, um, a memory, anything that was making you feel sad, and then it was an opportunity to get rid of it and move on. So in the exhibit, we built a shredder. So you write down your negative feelings and you put it through this cool shredder and um, you get to see your message, your negative feeling go away. Then in the exhibit, you could take the shreds and then add them to a display wall. And that's what these jars on in the photographs are where you could take the, the shredded paper and, and add them to the jar wall and then it turned the negative feelings into something positive. Um, frankly, this is one of the most popular exhibits, especially among adults because it's very satisfying. The physical activity of shredding the paper is just very at the gut, very satisfying. And it's also fun. This was a, an example, frankly, of, and you can see with the little girl on the bottom, she's shredding some papers with scribbles. But again, that's okay. At some point too, with these interactive exhibits and um, that are all ages, we wanna have activities to engage. And um, every person is going to interact with an experience at their level of understanding. So in a lot of ways, it's okay that she is shredding the paper with the scribbles on it. And, and then an older child is writing something very specific and they have that physical experience too. But for parents too, it was really a way to show that you can have, when you have this physical need to, to shred or to get this, these angry feelings out, you can do it in a controlled, safe way. Um, and it's just, it's that, it's super satisfying. Um, the other good thing about this exact activity that we found over the years is, you know, obviously in our traveling exhibit, we have this very well-built fancy shredder that we custom made, but as a activity, it's just about the shredding and you can do this uh, with a little, you know, $2 uh, office max shredder to a manual shredder. It's not really about um, the big fancy exhibit pieces. It's about the concept. 
So, um, and that the core of what the activity is. So this was one of our favorites too, because it was so scalable and, uh, and very accessible. So this is another idea um, around that of taking something negative and turning um, it into something positive or being able to challenge uh, channel those negative activities into something positive. So you could also write a negative feeling or story or your uh, the, the negative and turn it into positive by um, through origami. And this activity is uh, folding the paper with a negative message on it into a boat and then floating it away and seeing and being able to release it. So again, this idea of releasing the negative. And for us in this exhibit, it was really important um, to introduce the negative feelings, but to give it a positive outlook because um, we don't wanna tell children that their negative feelings are bad or um, not to have them or to suppress them. We want you to acknowledge them and then give you a tool to manage them. So another writing activity are our response walls. So this is something I know we've all seen. It's, it's very common and um, very popular to write messages and have these big colorful display walls. And um, we did it here. And in this case too, we posed two questions. How has someone been kind to you? And what do you do when you feel mad? And these were really guiding questions for the whole exhibit. And um, another part of the exhibit, we have in terms of the language, we have a lot of redundancy here, especially uh, in language and in messaging because there are these fundamental ideas and um, we know everybody will come to um, learn in different ways and, uh, and absorb ideas in different ways. So we like that red redundancy, but having the activity that reinforces these fundamental ideas of love and forgiveness, um, but giving it as a, a challenge to um, a next step problem solve. So I have to say it was really, when we were developing, developing this exhibit, it was a challenge to think about the, the forgiveness because it always came back to a single act that um, required someone to forgive you for. So, it, so how do you, in an exhibit like this, we didn't wanna encourage people to do something that needed to be forgiven. So that's where we use this idea of uh, recollection and thinking back and storytelling and being able to share and communicate um, something that might have happened to you in the past. And it could have been the recent past. It could have been in the car, on the way to the museum, two siblings are fighting. So again, it's thinking about these ideas in, um, in scale and in even in, in time. It's something that immediate that just happened or it's this something that happened years ago and it's been bothering you. So again, we, we kind of looked at these ideas and tried to present them, these fundamental basic ideas in a lot of different ways so you could get to the, um, discuss them in context of, of that scale in both time and magnitude of um, how bad was it. The other thing about this writing before I move on is we got a lot of pushback or challenged whether we have this exhibit for you know children and you're requiring so much writing, everything has to be written. Um, we did not know how this would work. We were really happy to see that kids do, they're practicing writing, they want to write, they're learning their vocabulary. So um, we found the participation was very high. Uh, and also even just always having a physical tactile act and activity to do. So if a child wasn't interested in the writing or they just wanted to make marks on a card or on th there was a physical thing for them to do. So even just the act of tying the tags onto the wall, they're still participating and helping. So I mentioned that there are these guiding questions um, that really frame the exhibit at, at the end of the day. And it is, how has someone been kind to you and what do you do when you feel mad? And it was really important um, for us to, to frame these questions this way. And especially on the, um, on the forgiveness side, the, the bad, angry side, it's how did, um, what do you do when you feel mad? That's a really important message for us when we started looking at, um, at these ideas, especially for children that uh, you are not, that you're in control of your feelings, that you are not bad, you are not mad, 
you are feeling mad, you have a bad feeling or you're, but that the feelings can change and that you are not inherently an angry person. You are not inherently a bad person just because you're having an emotional moment. You're having a tantrum in this moment that you can kind of circle back, get under control and move on. So um, that was really key. And we worked with a lot of people about that wording. Um, and the same for the, the kind, how has someone been kind to you? Um, we have really a, a lot of broad, um, this gives us a lot of broad answers. It can be a tangible gift. It can be a thing, an object, but it can also just be how has someone been kind to you. And it, it ends up, we would get lots of responses about how someone made them feel. So I'm gonna pause there for a minute to see if anybody, um, before we go on to the activity um, and see if anybody has any questions about the exhibit itself. And thank you so much. And just to let everybody know, if you do have a question or a comment, you can either type it into the chat box or if you prefer, you can unmute yourself and, and feel free to engage in a conversation now. Um, I would like to just make a quick comment, uh, following up on our, you know, the other workshop and our ongoing conversation. Uh, and um, and I've noticed that we have uh, two new uh, friends just joined, um, Sarah and Amy, welcome. Um, so one of the things that we are exploring in these workshops, and especially in uh, Anne's workshop from the Pittsburgh Children's Museum, is that the tools that they are developing are so profound and so, you know, it's so archetypal, you know, um, I mean, we don't really change much when we get older, you know, we keep our, you know, core values and core, you know, character characters, I think, intact. So it is really important to uh, shape them right uh, at a young age. But, uh, but these uh, activities, I think, can also be useful in professional development setting. They, they can be customized, you know, rethought and uh, reapplied. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, to all of our uh, participants here, Sarah, Sarah Amy, uh, and Greg, of course, and us, uh, I would like to invite us all to think about those terms too. So please just not try to think that, you know, the, oh, this is just the exhibition about children and we are learning about that. But one of our goals is to really like, how, how can we scale these experiences? How can we take them to other contexts for different age groups or different groups and communities to uh, explore together? Uh, just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's, that's absolutely right. I'll take this moment too to give you a little history on the exhibit and, and actually where it's been. You know, obviously, it started with us at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. And um, when it started touring, it did really go to um, children's museums and our traditional audiences, but we also have been to um, adult museums. It went to the um, Canadian Museum of Human Rights. And that was really interesting because they put it um, in their context. Not only we changed the language, uh, it, it became a French first exhibit. So we worked with them. Um, we changed the quotes we have, you know, on those mirrors and different parts of the exhibit. We, in our context, uh, with the folks who developed it, we, we picked some inspirational quotes that we thought talked about love and forgiveness um, for our audiences. And then when it went to um, the uh, Canadian Museum of Human Rights, they uh, chose different people to quote, which was wonderful. And then later it went to the Muhammad Ali Center in um, Kentucky. And that again, is a, not a children's museum. They would have high school students, middle school students, but it was really an adult audience and they put it in their context. So when I spoke earlier about um, creating exhibits that were responsive, that was key too, because love and these ideas of love and forgiveness are so um, contextual and cultural and um, even uh, generational we knew this exhibit would, we wanted this exhibit to travel for years. We knew that our context was limited to the people in the room, the eight people who were part of this. This was our interpretation. So it was really for us a step away from any kind of exhibit we had done before 
in the response, the level of responsiveness. So being able to um, adapt it to almost anything, but still give it enough context that it still was about love and forgiveness. That was the balance that we were, that, that line we were walking the whole time. Um, so I will, uh, having said that, let's go back to this last example or this next example that um, talks about uh, what Elif was mentioning about the um, ideas of professional development training. And a lot of this did come out, um, we started traveling in 2014, it's now 2021, but basically the last six years before COVID, we've picked up different ideas along the way. Um, and we've presented this in different contexts. Um, it's, I should have, I could preface this earlier. Part of this exhibit project did include um, a research and learning evaluation study. We have an internal learning and research department and we did um, uh, a full uh, pre and summative evaluation. Our researcher followed this for the first year to different venues and, um, and studied it. And that was one of this idea of the responsiveness and how flexible the language actually is. Um, so a, a good example is the story puzzle. And um, when we developed, added this to the exhibit, it was kind of late in the process because we found that we did have a lot of open-ended writing exhibits that took more skill. And when I say skill, like first grade and up skills. So we wanted to make sure there were things in there for um, that introduced, it, introduced language for the preschool set. So we wanted a tangible tactile puzzle. So you can see here in this photograph, it's a wooden puzzle um, and it is kind of oversized in that way that's great and tangible for, for small hands that you can pick it up. And we have, um, it's a, designed as a Penrose. It's a variation of a Penrose puzzle, which is this idea of an infinity puzzle where you have just two pieces and they can be uh, arranged in multiple, multiple, multiple ways, but there's no end conclusion to the puzzle. It, you can just keep it going forever. So, we prototyped this idea of the Penrose infinity puzzle as a story puzzle, because we wanted to continue. And I was talking about how we wanted, we were being redundant or reiterating uh, language and vocabulary. And we saw this as an opportunity to introduce some of the vocabulary words of love and forgiveness. In a lot of the activities in the exhibit, we're asking children and visitors, all visitors, to write their feelings, write their ideas of love and forgiveness. But we didn't have a, a place yet to even introduce that vocabulary. So we used this puzzle as that opportunity um, to introduce the words. We also decided to use symbols. And again, this is going back, way back in 2013, 2014, where this was a little bit novel that we're using the emojis or, or symbol language and connecting it to, with words or even replacing symbols with words. Again, it's kind of funny to think it wasn't that long ago. Um, so that's where we were. This, uh, the photograph on the right is uh, with the taped words or actually a prototype um, where we were playing with the lines with where to place the images and where to place the words. And then uh, the photograph in the, in the top is um, actually the finished puzzle. So one thing about these puzzles, and it's now that I look at this prototype, it's kind of interesting. The prototype kind of speaks to this idea of um, the puzzle as a tool for professional development. Because frankly, once you start this idea of a puzzle that can be um, ongoing, you can make it as a, an individual piece and that then could be joined with other people's puzzles. Um, this is an example of the set we made for the Canadian Museum of Human Rights that was uh, French and English. And uh, we worked with them with some of the words they wanted to use. Uh, we also changed the colors. And uh, when we start looking and, and talking about these puzzles and how we communicate and convey um, uh, stories about love and forgiveness or emotions or whatever, that color is a device that um, can be part of that narrative. Line is a device, um, pattern making. 
So we really wanted to explore and look at all of these ways to do that. But you can see here, this is just one of the two pieces. Um, so it, it's a, a very accessible um, and satisfying puzzle to put together. <laughs> no frustrating pieces you can't find the right part to. Um, so uh, over the years, like you know, I've been saying, we've been experimenting with this. And recently, we worked with a company to make a more traditional small uh, cardboard puzzle version. And that's what this is. Um, we changed the words again. We changed uh, the puzzle, uh, the colors a little bit. But the, the shapes are the same. And the idea of the line work as the guiding tool um, to help people put things, make matches and put things together in addition to the idea of connecting the words in some way. This um, version does not use the symbols. It is uh, just uh, the words, just using um, uh, language vocabulary words. But you can see the variety of ways you can put them together. Here's some more examples of that. And this is a version we did recently for, um, and apologize, this was my test <laughs> on version uh, for an organization here in Pittsburgh that serves um, uh, uh, youth, uh, middle school students, and they were very focused on self-esteem. So we changed the colors. These are their colors that they wanted to use in a part of their community. And uh, we added words like more adjectives like strong and smart and um, they wanted to have this be about positive um, self-esteem and, and, and have the children who were coming from lots of challenging um, situations begin to learn to associate themselves and their personalities with these um, positive words. So that's another twist on the um, use of the puzzle that we hadn't thought about when we were making love and forgiveness, that this can be a tool for um, for. Uh, coaching and social emotional learning in a different way um, and can be self-reflective and about self-care. Um, and uh, we were talking too about th those stories that you can tell. So they only wanted the positive words because the kids from these communities had frankly been inundated with, with the negative. So again, that's was um, we were happy to do that. And that's the nice thing about this simple um, this tool. So at the end of the day, the puzzle pieces really are about making connections um, using words, color, pattern, symbols, and images. And then this idea of that we can frame the story around a, sim uh, a single question. Um, you know, in actually, you know, working with Elif and, and talking about this puzzle as a professional development tool, um, and taking it out of the context of XOXO, out of an exhibit context, out of um, even a museum context, what you would need to make it a useful tool to and um, still use it and, and get a good outcome. And we've been talking about those guiding questions. And as I thought about it, I actually hadn't, um, you know, earlier I was talking about the two questions, how someone would be kind to you and um, what do you do when you feel mad? that in fact, even though I didn't put it in the same terms as you have helped me um, see that we did have guiding questions for that exhibit. So at the end of the day, um, you know, in terms of how you can write your story or tell a story about love and forgiveness or whatever, it, you know, posing a question can be a really effective starting point. So here are, um, here are the puzzle pieces. You can see this is just a basic outline um, from a design standpoint. Um, we we played around with the um, with the shapes because we wanted it to be attractive when it um, when it comes together. And having these curved lines, it's a very pleasing um, shape. And then basically, however you put it together, it still makes something visually aesthetically pleasing. What um, can completely change are the colors of the background, of the lines. Um, and then there are these bands that where we put the, the words, the vocabulary words. And then you can see here there are uh, symbols that is, are associated with the, um, with the words. So what we thought we'd do today and try is um, we were 
for some of you, I, we hope that um, we share the PDF. So if you would like to, uh, to take some time and make a story puzzle yourself, we can take that time. We have, we're gonna take about a 15 minute break. Um, what I added today, if we can go here, created a mural board and the link to the mural is in the chat. And the other thing we could do today is to discuss um, what some of those guiding questions could be to, to facilitate um, this puzzle in an activity for different contexts, for different audiences, depending um, what you wanna do with it. We'd love to kind of have a discussion about what you, how you might see using this puzzle um, for your audience in a, in, at your museum or in your work. Um, and then also this idea, I'm really interested in expanding the idea of the, the, um, the vocabulary or even are there words, are there phrases, are there starters that we could provide that would be those key links to get um, to meaningful discussions about um, people's feelings. And, and one thing kind of going back um, to the fundamentals of all of this, it's how having a playful experience is really a great way to break down people's barriers. Because frankly, if, you're, if you go right to someone and ask them a really hard question, like how are you feeling or how did this person make you feel? Um, they might, not everyone might want to share that, uh, your personal feelings. So, and especially, well, adults and children. But if you have a puzzle, it's, there's no pressure. You can just start playing with the puzzles and, and ask someone to put a pattern together or what kind of relationships you see between uh, with the, the vocabulary words and, and how, and you'll find that these can be like a great icebreaker, just a really um, gentle way to, to get to that. Um, you'll also find that people will start noticing what, if you're doing this as a group, might see what somebody else is doing and then see relationships and start a conversation. Um, but it's always good, even if you want to, we're actually working with, um, we're working with some hospitals and using this as a, a therapy tool that it's just, you're not necessarily asking someone or a child or a young person to, to share something they might not be ready to share. But if you are noticing and reading their puzzle or looking at their puzzle, you can comment on their puzzle and it creates that kind of a, a bridge too. So, um, let me go back actually to, let me see here. I can try to go back to the image of the puzzle, let me exit here. Um, so last time we did this on Monday, we had some questions about instructions for the puzzles. So if you would like to play and have a, um, have an opportunity to print these out either today or, or you know another time you just cut along these lines and then there's another in the pdf there's another shape as well and literally just playing with them um and fitting the they'll they'll fit together in um some pretty uh pretty obvious ways you'll see how how they work together um and then if you'd like to share today on the mural, um, I think you could take a photograph or a screenshot and you can add it here. Um, another way to use the mural is just to take a sticky note and you can either contribute um, and share a question you think might be good or just some vocabulary words or some other, some other information you'd like to share and then we can look at that together. So I'll stop there if anyone has any questions. Um, and if we wanted to take a 10 or a 15 minute break to kind of think about the puzzles and the questions, and then we could reconvene and, and discuss it as a group. Uh, I'm also thinking, you know, I have a feeling that some of the people in the group, they are sort of either on the go or in public places oh. that may not have access to, you know, like a large screen with a, uh, uh, oh, okay. So I, I wonder, I mean, we can still take a short break, but I'm just throwing this as an idea. Uh, I wonder if we should just keep talking about our ideas and then people can join in and then uh, we'll see where we 
arrive and you know, they can chat. And I feel like uh, Sarah already mentioned that, you know, she's, she's out. And uh, so it may be difficult for some people, but I don't know. Sure. I mean, I'm, no, I'm I available think... to participate either Yeah, way. no, I understand. Yeah, that's fine. We can stay wonder, here. I'm happy to stay here. Yep. No, Anne, Anne I wonder if, if you would pull your, your mural back up um, and this might prompt people, we could, you know, if people had to, uh, a word or a thought to share, mm -hmm. um, you might just be able to populate the mural uh, for us. Yeah, that would be great, actually. I think we can, that would be wonderful. We can just drop ideas in the chat and, and um, then we have, you know, a central person doing that, <laughs> doing the, yeah. you know, adding the information. That's fine. The nice thing about um, not to plug mural or even there are lots of these uh, Jamboard is another free thing. What I like about them is multiple people can um, can add in at once. So um, mm -hmm. actually I'm, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a good one. So I'm gonna start adding some questions. And then, um, I'll use this occasion too, to kind of give you a um, little context of what's happening next with us, with the puzzle and with the exhibit. Um, so like I said, you know, it's still a, a traveling exhibit and we're, um, it's going to California actually to, um, it'll be at the Children's Creativity Museum in January. It's been in storage um, for a while from uh, COVID, we had some, cancellations, but um, it's going back on the road. It'll be in San Francisco. Um, and we're really excited to work with them because they, um, that group is uh, going to help us develop some more specific um, PD and training around this idea of the puzzles. Um, Cause we recently uh, formed a partnership with an organization called um, Open the Joy and uh, she is able, she's our manufacturer of the, um, of the small puzzles. And uh, so we're experimenting with this idea of, of these breakout um, activities that can be used with adults, yeah. teachers um, outside of a museum context. Yeah. And, um, and I've been you know, just putting some ideas um, I, I'm sorry, I missed the, I was typing something and I missed the, so you're going to San Francisco to meet with another museum or just a, like a puzzle? Uh, so the, so, yeah, so the exhibit um, is going to the Children's Creativity Museum in San Francisco in January. And okay. they're going to have the exhibit for six months. And during that um, appearance, they're going to help us prototype some of the, um, some of these ideas around the, the story puzzle as a professional development um, tool or a breakout tool for classrooms and teachers. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, um, that's wonderful. And um, if I may, I'm just gonna, I would like to share a few ideas. Uh, I don't know if anybody needs a break at this moment or shall we just keep going? Uh, no, let's keep going. Okay, so. Um, and, 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 you know, this, uh, so this is what I did from uh, last time, right? And let me see if I can see myself in a little bit. You know, this is, this is from our last workshop. And I think I was thinking of using something like this um, in, a, uh, in an aquarium. Uh, and I was thinking, uh, because the Seattle Aquarium, they will also have a, a, a session uh, at the Empathy Summit workshops I think tomorrow, uh, and their challenge is, you know, how to foster empathy towards wildlife. Uh, and more particularly, most particularly is uh, towards uh, those creatures that do not look like us, because we know that we tend to empathize with uh, beings that look like us with an eye and a mouth and a hand, so we can actually relate to their experiencing of the world. But what about a, you know, sea star or a sea urchin or a barnacle? Uh, or a you know seahorse you know that doesn't look like anything like us, and uh, and some or crustaceans you know they might look cold to some. Why is that? 
so, so how, what are some of the things that can make us feel closer to them? And I was thinking, you know, in front of, let's say, um, a, a touch table where they have in aquariums, right? You, you get to touch the sea star or the you know, little rocks or uh, sea urchins and things like that on, in the pool. You can pose a question with these puzzles around it and you can say, you know, what, what, is, what is a home to you, for example? What, what, what is home to you? And then, you know, kids can, or it could be adults, you know, they can put their own ideas in there. And then that could be a, a meaningful way into talking about the group, about you know, how a, a sea urchin considers a home or, or a sea star. And, and that's why we, we're not supposed to actually make those rock towers on the beaches because those rocks are actually homes for each one of those creatures. How would you feel if somebody you know, like, put your right. apartment, like stack, stack them up somewhere? And, um, and, uh, but the, and the other idea that I've been, and I, I'm, I'll, I know that I'll keep talking, thinking about this because I also have a workshop coming up um, uh, at a museum and, and I was thinking, how, how could I use and these, these puzzles? So I, I love the uh, geometric designs um, in, inspired by Islamic art. Mm -hmm. and, and like this particular one particularly interests me because you know those stars, I mean, the, the basis, the, the structure of all the stars are the same, but the how we see them, like they appear in different ways, right? Like these, mm -hmm. none of them look like each other. Although the, the, the framework within which they are placed are the same. So I felt like, you know, like something like this could work well with, with adults um, uh, and maybe talking about, you know, uh, how can we uh, uh, talk about our core values? Uh, in our professional culture, in our office, for example. And then, and then I was thinking, you know, you could have, uh, you can give, you know, like each you know, individual, like different colors of these stars, you know, so that you know that each individual has, so they have to, you know, put maybe like eight things, you know, eight words in these. And I've just put, look, made them look like pizza slices, but, they can be more complex and artistically more beautiful. And, uh, but then, you know, so everybody puts there, you know, what they think, and then you can just bring them all together uh, in, a, in a flat surface and everybody walks around and talks. Uh, and then you ask them to uh, remove some of the redundant ones because the, surely there will be so many of those ideas that even, you know, people come from very different backgrounds will be very similar. So the idea to, is to arrive at one, one single star made of you know, different colors, uh, which represents the contributions of uh, everyone. Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting thing we've been exploring about actually um, this idea of a, a common shape or a common form used to um, create a, a common language amongst very, disparate ideas and people and uh, a way to create. Um, so we have a, a new exhibit coming up um, about, well, fashion, it's about fashion, but it's, it's called How You Wear It. And that balance of individuality and, um, and expression and that personal, and it has, it comes back down to feelings and it's this common form. So I love this idea of that, that same, and it's the puzzle, the same shape, and it's kind of gets back to this idea of designing for empathy, how you can, as designers, facilitators, um, whatever we all are in helping um, create these experiences and facilitation, it's, it's understanding what that common tool is that then um, connects all of us. It, it kind of creates this, um, uh, an equal, uh, uh, a parity, and a, we're all starting from the same point, but then, being able to completely make it personal and individual and then bring them back together and then seeing what that quilt, it's like the crazy quilt kind of idea too, um, where everyone, uh, that tradition of the, the squares that uh, different people get the, make a, a simple quilted square, but within that same shape format, it's completely different. And then it's all comes 
they're joined to create together to create the the quilt and then that's, that's the a really maybe the, you know they're it's a beautiful thing so um i love that that image i think that's probably connected to the the history of the penrose puzzles too i'm sure they all at some point came out of the same same tradition yeah it could be could be and then, you know, one other thing that, you know, the more I look at these puzzles is that um, another question that comes that I'm exploring currently is, you know, how can you, um, how can you, um, and I'm going to go very sort of conceptual here, but uh, uh, this concept from, you know, I to all, right? I mean, we are this individual, but we are part of something greater than ourselves. Uh, and and I think these puzzles might allow us to visually feel that, uh, that we are actually a part of something greater than ourself, ourselves. And, you know, putting together a puzzle could be one way, but another way could be, you know, maybe asking individuals to also remove certain things from that pattern and see how that feels. Mm, and, you know, like, Create, creating gaps, you know, intentional sort of a, intentional dilemmas for people. I have a feeling that most people will not like it, you know, especially imagine that you've created this beautiful pattern or tessellation or a beautiful puzzle, but then, and everybody is content, you know, like, oh, we all contributed, this completely represents us. Okay, and then you just, uh, everybody raises hands and there's total agreement. But then you start, you know, messing with it, you know, <laughs> that you start uh, maybe removing pieces and ask pe people you know, how they feel about that. Um, what, what would they add or what would they remove to make the unity even more beautiful according to them uh, after, what, after, after when they uh, agreed already that like this was the unity and the beautiful thing, the whole. And, uh, and, and, and the, the, the difficult thing is that, you know, like these, these patterns are, you know, beautiful, right? From, we can see the beauty of this pattern, it's cohesion and alignment, even though the stars are all different, uh, together they are beautiful. Uh, but how would you relay that message to this particular star that let's say she, is a part of something much beautiful and greater than herself, beyond her center of focus, which is at the center. And then she's connected to this and this and this. And then the, and, and the only reason this whole is so beautiful is because the unique natures of each of these. So it is not just like one, but it is all of them together make, the, make it beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is not really, well-baked idea, but I'm, I'm still thinking about it and how to, how would you express that with the, with the artwork? Uh, well, I, I like this too, because when we get back to, I mean, from my perspective as an exhibit designer as well, these are design tools and design language of additive and subtractive and positive and negative as a design driver. Um, but then having, and for me, that's what I get really excited and interested in um, is, is when we talk about designing for empathy, sometimes it is um, these basic fundamentals that a principle of design principles and then have to see them translate into something psychological and emotional that um, another practitioner, an expert, somebody like you, or other people on these on these sessions in, in this community you've assembled that are have other expertise that aren't designers, but it kind of when we it kind of clicks, um, and then you can see how these relationships work. And I think that in the end is when we develop these tools together, you actually get something that's usable and or really useful and and has multiple applications um, because at the core there are these fundamental principles that even different disciplines and practices share. Um, I agree. Because like are, when I think, yeah, these are very like very um, abstract and almost, um, I don't say emotionless, but these are 
when I think about myself and my training as a designer, positive and negative space, these are kind of just fundamental tools. And even thinking about color, they're, they're just almost, they're facts of the universe that <laughs> color and color theory and, and, but then to, to bring the human perspective to it, it's, it's not, you know, black and white, they're not like absolute facts when you put it in a context of um, a social, emotional and uh, feelings context, it's completely subjective. So I think that's kind of, for me, uh, kind of an interesting dichotomy there or what ends up happening and how we can, how we end up talking about these things. Yeah, yeah. yeah and um, so we have so some I've been adding questions. <laughs> Yeah, I, I added a lot of questions. I know Sarah and um, Searing and uh, let's see here, the chat. I don't know if anybody um, wants to comment on their question and to, to just jump in. And I um, thought these were interesting, you know, in the context of love and forgiveness, the um, how we extend really challenging, how we extend love to our enemy. Um, that's, a, that's a big idea and something that's, you know, obviously something we talk about with children, um, but it's something that adult, <laughs> a lot of these um, big ideas to never stop with, um, with childhood that they need to be, um, reinforced and practiced again and again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Home. Makes us human. Let's see. Yeah. Um, or even what is family? You know, that is a that's a great, well, that term family too has a, is um, a real point of discussion. And it's interesting how, you know, the idea of family is changing so much or people are getting more comfortable with discussing um, the, what, how families can be, can look different. So what you are suggesting is that, you know, I mean, like uh, these puzzles could be, you know, sort of customized with relevant words and images to help people start a conversation, just providing them with the visual and verbal vocabulary. Yes. And I think um, when we get back to this is a professional development tool, it's that um, also that balance of having different versions where like in XOXO, we had um, or for different groups where you provide all of the information in the sense that um, you can use this where you're, the puzzles are designed, you have the vocabulary, you have the images. And, and that's something in um, what we've been doing with schools. Um, we're doing a lot of work now actually with uh, hospitals. Um, both the, the two largest hospital groups in, in Western Pennsylvania, they both want to start using these puzzles as part of their therapy. Um, but what they're doing is we're making custom sets for them with, with, their, um, with their information that they vetted and they want to reinforce. Yeah. So it can be like literally a, a tool, but then at the other extreme, um, what do we do with, do we, for a, like a professional group like this, imagine bringing out, uh, if we were in person, a pile of, of blank, do you have blank puzzles on the one extreme? And the puzzle pieces are white and um, they might be a writable surface and with markers and then start posing and you just have the question. Mm -hmm. Or do you start linking them together? I think that's the other thing too, with this, the idea of, of play as that entry point do you have the lines and have this be a, a visual just to get people to start engaging with the puzzle and then layering in the words and the conversations and kind of um, 
uh, teasing that out and um, to, to get people more comfortable with the idea of playing and interacting with one another and um, looking at these pieces and then getting to the, the deeper questions. I think- if I, um, Yes, if I may jump in here, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what I was thinking as a, as a layered approach. So if you provided people these blank puzzle pieces, just to give them the sense of create, um, bringing the pieces together to create a pattern, to create something that has some aesthetic value for them in whatever ways. And then once they're settled into that as an experience, then you can start to introduce the concepts through the words and, and what they mean. I, I love that idea. And you know, one thing I will say about the puzzles from um, the exhibit point of view and when we present it to, to kids, they're so, I mean, obviously, kids are so good at this and they're so sophisticated actually in, uh, and connected um, to their feelings and sharing that, um, especially you know five and under when they're just talking. So they'll go right to it and, um, and start putting puzzle pieces together and immediately taking the story actually up to a really like elevated, complete narrative. And you can come over and they'll start telling you this amazing full story that was just prompted. You're like, you see a word, a symbol, and they've created a, a full narrative around it. And then that's where, especially this work we're doing with, um, we're just starting with the Allegheny Health Network and family therapy, that th we're interested in this because the therapists think the children will go right to the puzzle and start playing and actually communicating some ideas that the therapists want them to communicate. But then it's the it's a way to get the parents to start expressing and seeing things that they might not even be hearing. So um, I think it's so interesting to see how you know adults and children are, and we're we both need this, and we can everyone can benefit from this. But it's it is the the other spec. It's where I find it surprising that you would assume or some. Body might assume at first that you know with children you need it to be the most simple and it'll, they'll be most basic and they're going to build up but actually with something like this too they're going to come in with a full rich um experience and then words stories images everything in their head and then you can kind of deconstruct back down to get to this core where the adults too you might have to do a lot of building and layering and considering and it, there's a little more reluctance there um, so that idea of the imaginative play and getting the adults to that point, um, it's kind of when you use this, when we think about this, the kit or the tool for, uh, and I think it, it's probably seven years old, seven or eight years old where that, that breaking point, because once you start getting into middle school, the, the reluctance builds up and our reserve starts building up. But, um, yeah, there's kind of this inverted uh, tipping point where the language might need to be more simple and you could use more sophisticated or richer or more expansive vocabulary for the adults, but the imagination and the storytelling um, might be more, more filled out and richer and more expansive for the younger kids and how you can kind of use this to, to go both ways, layer, layer up and layer down. Yeah. So Anne, as you're talking and, and this puzzle idea has been around for several years. You mentioned earlier about some research that you had research going out to the various sites and institutions for this exhibit generally. Um, what, what is the research? What is it finding for you? Well, what we found with the exhibit as a whole um, were that these open-ended experiences um, that were based in, in writing and language and introducing that language that um, we found that the conversations did continue after that was the one of the things we wanted to, to decide to see is the conversations in the language that was started or introduced in the exhibit, did it continue at home afterwards? And um, we found that it did. Um, and I can share um, with this group um, the summative evaluation that talks about it specifically. Um, but that was key that the, and when we think about 
museum experiences and the amount of time somebody may have um, with it and they're largely unfacilitated and you know outside the 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 briefest engagement that someone might have with the exhibit um, can it still have an impact and we found that um, families were um, using the language um, even to the extent of um, using some of the simple tools of tearing up paper or um, that, you know, writing something bad and, and scrunching it up, but that the conversation started, um, tended to continue. So that was really positive. Um, and that's why, frankly, we continued, um, I'm sorry, the more I push her away, the more she <laughs> gets. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that was um, the other thing too, it was a way for, we found that adults, it did give them some basic, uh, the the tools to start those conversations that they didn't know how to start and it was with these fundamental questions um that you could have those tough conversations about love and forgiveness by just asking how has someone been kind to you um so so that's that was really positive and it actually through the um ex this experience changed how we designed all of our exhibits and it gave us the encouragement um I guess is the word to to be less um, uh, prescriptive in our exhibit design, especially when we're doing exhibits about emotions. That um, you can trust visitors um, with with content and and adding and that agency to actually contribute to the content in a meaningful way. Um, that there will be enough participation. I mean, I think, I think that's always um, a challenge is you don't know uh, if they will participate, but um, if there's enough redundancy in the messaging too, that, um, that you, can, you can have these big ideas, but you don't have to as a museum or as the professionals presume that you have deliver all the answers. And that I think also is key to exhibits that are based in social emotional learning and also for families. And one of the things we talk about the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh often is what differentiates our, our role from like a, a science museum. And science museums or history museums that are very specific on content um, and have a specific content and information data to deliver, they don't have that luxury um, to say they don't necessarily know the answer. But for us, when we're talking about children and families and even the social emotional content, it's okay for us to say, we don't know and we want your help and we want you to participate. Um, this has actually come up very recently where we're talking about a new exhibit we wanna develop in two years where and I was just um, actually talking with my executive director on Friday after we had done this session on Thursday, this idea of guiding questions. So we're looking at this, um, taking this a step further where we're going, we're thinking about how we could work with children and families to establish the questions for an exhibit about emotions um, and let those guiding questions inform us in terms of the content. So the exhibit would come from the big questions that kids have um, and really kind of take this, the step. And I was so excited, you know, about the timing of this conversation. I'm like, you won't believe what we've just been talking about, <laughs> how we can deconstruct to these questions. But what happens when, a, you know, that we design to answer these questions or to create spaces where these kids can get these questions answered? I don't even know, but it's about, it's, it would be about emotions. Um, so yeah, that's, um, I think at, at the end of the day, we did find that the, and especially when what we were studying in 2014 with this specifically, it is going back um, to the language, um, the conversations of communication, did the communication um, continue? And were we able to, um, through play, all these experiences at the end of the day were, were playful and I have to say, you know, even with um, when we, we did this exhibit too as a pop-up um, over the holidays in downtown Pittsburgh, there was an empty storefront and we took the basic activities, the shredding, we did the big response wall um, 
and it was people out, you know, for dinner, the theater and dropping in and mostly adults. And they just had so much fun. Yeah. Um, which again, it's like writing things and hanging the, I, I guess to the one thing I'd really want to impart from our perspective and my perspective, it's the physicality, the analog, the tactile, the, the real experience is becoming more and more novel and inherently more and more fun. Like we human beings, we need to touch and feel and do things. Yeah. Tablets are great. Everyone's got a smartphone. Kids, this is just boring and not a big deal to them being able to do the touch screen. So that's one whole part on everyone too. Um, it's okay. It doesn't have to be high tech. Sometimes adults and just anyone thinks they need the, the next greatest thing. And that's very cool. And we're experimenting with augmented reality and doing all that too. But fundamentally too, um, it's okay if it's just a paper and pencil. Uh, that well, people can have fun doing that. Even this mural exercise that you've got here, this software, which I think is terrific, like Google Jamboard, of course, mm -hmm. um, it's a, a tech spin on using post-it notes on a, a flip chart. And I use this with my, use flip charts and post-it notes with my students when they're brainstorming the big ideas or the guiding questions for an exhibition concept and um, bubble charts and concept maps and drawing these things out with, with markers and, and post-it notes on a flip chart or a big wall of paper or, or whatever it might be. It's really powerful to get the ideas out of your head, get them literally on paper, not, you don't have to process it on screen, but getting it on paper, and then you can start to translate it into some more refined um, prog project or, or deliverable uh, using some technology. But I think that's an essential um, piece of play that I perhaps sometimes adults, we just haven't, you know, we've not been empowered to think like that anymore. Play is for kids and work is for adults. And so what you just described about adults really loving it, reminds us that we still have that element of play in us mm -hmm. if, if we're given permission to, to employ it. Yeah, and, and I think that's key too. It's that permission. It's okay. Um, it's okay to play. I mean, I think one, maybe one positive thing coming out of pandemic could be that people are appreciating the need for simple things again. Um, for the idea of the walks in nature, the unfacilitated kind of natural uh, core experiences. Um, frankly, I mean, you know, the idea that the cat, <laughs> the primal, that we're we're more connected to to as we kind of this forced time out to a certain extent. But um, when we do come back together, it's having those reasons. And one thing, since we've been reopened at the museum, people want to be together and play together. Um, and if we are kind of looking back to the big idea of design um, elements too, analog is coming back because it, and especially for kids who have been on Zoom and tablets and going to school virtually, mm -hmm. they're over it as much as, I mean, <laughs> it's gonna be 19, I feel like it's 1975 all over again. Um, they want just to play with stuff and there's real learning and there are many people who are part of this organization, this community that study the brain. And there's that hand-eye coordination, even you know, understanding handwriting. We know now what's lost and what you can learn by writing is actually commits things to memory. And you know, kids aren't writing with pen, pencil and paper and putting that down because we all have the tablets, but that that physical act is really um, important and helps with memory. So, you know, when we circle back to topics around feelings and around empathy, um, these kind of old fashioned writing, physical, making marks and being in physical spaces together and kind of doing that analog stuff um, can make these experiences more memorable than just another tweet or um, something uh, solely digital. Um, 
But I will say I, I'm not, a, a, it, there's a balance. One thing we're talking a lot about at the museum is the mixed reality, but it's, we always, you wanna balance the analog and the digital and see how they can work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this uh, this uh, idea uh, also reminds me of uh, the Exploratorium's uh, Science of Sharing exhibits. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have you seen? Have you visited that? And maybe I this time, maybe in San Francisco, if when you go, you know, it may be a, um, I, I think it is still on. Um, but I only hesitate because I don't remember. I was in San Francisco and at the Exploratorium in August of 2019, but my mind is a blur. It's not that long ago. But I feel like, yeah that we went. We actually went there and and visited <laughs> and saw that. That was yeah. So there there was this um, exhibit there. Um, I think I may have seen it also as a prototype uh, at the AAM conference or somewhere. That, you know they had this like a uh, coffee table and they had a sort of like a ring uh, a ring holder you know the key holder mm -hmm. thing with a, like a little metal ring with uh, sort of laminated uh, uh, words uh, and, and, and a, like a whole stack of words you know and just like in a, you go to the painter and you just pick you know the paint uh, so you just pick a word basically mm -hmm. and then and then they had a um, they had a deck of cards on the table. Uh, and I believe it was also like a, like a placemat setting again, you know, like because each person had a, like a four, had a place where they could place four cards. Mm -hmm. So you immediately understand that, oh, you know, let's see, you know, like, okay, uh, home, for example. And then you look at the, you start looking at the images, the, the deck of cards uh, of images and, start putting, you know, what is home to you in your uh, section. And that just creates a conversation because others can see what you're putting and maybe they have something completely different uh, imagery on their section and um, just starts a conversation. And I was thinking, you know, puzzles are this way too, right? I mean, you could almost have a, for, for adults, um, you could even have it like a placemat setting almost, you know, <laughs> uh, that, that would have, have, have like spaces for these shapes. Uh, and then, then you can actually take your contribution and place it right next to somebody else mm -hmm. and, and then see what happens. Of course, you know, I'm not a designer, but I just like thought that, oh, that would be kind of neat. <laughs> yeah, that placemat tablecloth Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it just has like the outlines and then, and yeah, just that, again, simple prompts. We think about that all the time to get um, those entry points uh -huh. and one, yeah, how you can get people started, but without, um, without doing it for them or without showing, that's the other thing, just to get little, the idea and basic idea started and then let them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really oh, spread. Oh. The other idea with these puzzles too, we've been talking about um, is, so the language is one thing, but what if you, um, could you convey a story with only color or only images and create um, enough of a mood in how color is so evocative, but it's also very subjective. Um, so that would be when we start, if we start thinking about this puzzle as a tool for different audiences, um, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity for variation and then also kind of that concentration and specialization um, or even as a, a tactile, do we, uh, is, are, are there other puzzle designs in this idea that the shapes themselves, um, is there without it, with it still being this uh, Penrose, it's kind of what you were talking about with the patterns, but is there a dimensionality and layers 
to kind of to stack them. That's the other thing too. I started thinking about: could you make these as um, as stackable? Yes, yes, that's very interesting. And I don't know if I can pull it up, but I I was at the Phillips uh, collection the other day, and there there's this uh, piece uh, in in one of the exhibits. So it's inspired ah. by or origami, but it is mm -hmm. covered in quilt. Actually, this is all fabric. Oh, wow. And, wow. Uh, and I was like, you know, all over this piece, you know, taking uh, images from like side and, you know, from underneath because it looks different from every which angle. And um, like this. Oh, wow. And, and it is truly contemplative, you know, because of the, 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 the shape that it has, this diamond shape, I think it is very inviting in a way. It gives a focal point. And I know we are, I'm digressing, but um, I was just thinking, you know, this is very architectural also, you know, and, and this again reminded me uh, this element of Islamic architecture where at the entrance of, you know, big, you know, buildings like mosques or um, uh, caravansarais, uh, there's this big, you know, entrance, you know, the, the, the door where those geometric patterns are actually almost 3D. They have a sculptural, uh, and when you walk underneath, it is like stalactites, you know, uh, mm. and, and it just changes the whole thing, you know, it makes them alive almost, uh, gives That's this really different energy. And, uh, and I thought, you know, it would be really interesting to, yeah, I mean, that, this, that piece inspired me to think about that, like the 3D aspect of those uh, patterns. That would be very interesting. Yeah. Well, that's um, another thing. Once you think about scale um, and what that does to emotions or even puts people into um, a different frame of mind mm -hmm. and, um, you create a physical, and if we kind of are thinking about these tools to to engage our emotions, do you do you in terms of scale, do you create spaces that um, cause or are evocative of and, and cause a physical response um, and, right. and a different mood? And it, a, right. you know, yeah, it's just it when you think if you put all of this in context of um, and that exploration, we've you know we've all well. I know in our in our work at the museum too, when we're thinking about these um, gross motor skills, and even in our exhibit XOXO, we wanted to make sure there were gross motor skills or physical, like really active physical play, to balance the um, the fine motor or in the quieter or the writing activities. So we actually added um, as part of the exhibit, we have um, something called a balance seesaw. So it's essentially a, a a, a full size, it's a nine foot long seesaw, but it has a level on it, it has a tube. So um, in that tube, there's a ball that is half black and half white. And so essentially it functions as a level where two people, it's not about just the seesawing, but you kind of work together to find balance and get that ball to be still in the middle. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we, we understood, especially with kids, we needed a some people express themselves physically and needed that physical, but I love that idea of, of um, talk about that risk. Do you kind of uh, create physical situations that kind of evoke feelings of comfort, fear? Mm -hmm. Is there, how can you physically manifest love and forgiveness in a physical space, in, the, in an exhibit space, in a museum space, in a classroom? That's right, that's right. Well, this was, this is just, um... This was wonderful. <laughs> so, well, I looking at the time, I can't, we're we're about at um, quarter of, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if anybody has any other um, like me to talk about anything else, and I know we can all kind of continue talking about <laughs> these ideas. Um, I mean, it's maybe to wrap up, what I can do is um, I can talk about our next steps um, with the love and forgiveness 
exhibit in general and with this puzzle. Um, specifically for the puzzle, I mentioned we're working with a, a manufacturing partner, a uh, really interesting woman um, who has an organization called Open the Joy and a nonprofit arm of that called Share the Joy. And she's creating um, a whole series of um, social emotional toolkits um, for kids. And it was prompted by her personal experience with her daughter being um, in the hospital for an extended period of time. She, she wanted to, she was bringing things to her daughter's bedside to make her um, feel better. So that ended up becoming um, a company where she makes these kits. And I discovered her during the pandemic and uh, reached out to her and, and asked her if she would want to partner on our XOXO exhibit to make a kit. And that's where we ended up um, she, we have a, a whole um, activity box based on the exhibit, but, um, and within that are the puzzle pieces. So now she and I, um, I've been talking with her the last couple of months about this idea of using this as a, a broader tool and, and breaking this out. Um, so that's, that's one thing I'm excited and, and hopeful to do is to um, be able to produce these puzzle pieces um, as as tangible objects in a in an affordable way and and scale it up um, so that we could use these as a as a PD tool and even this idea of having big bags of them that we could take out and put out um, in addition to to making them as exhibit components um, and then the idea of of you know practicing frankly the the opportunities that I've had through um, this organization on a um, on some professional development workshops and our learning research team um, and is working with us to, um, to develop this into um, a PD training for teachers. So with the focus that we like to train the trainers or teach the facilitators and then they could take this back to their classrooms. And so we're hoping that we have a couple of different organizations we're talking to then we'll also do the data and the research on that and be able to kind of um, uh, see the results and, and have this as a, a living working experiment tool in social emotional learning uh, for K through 12, but also for, um, for adults, um, for schools. And then the, the thing I'm frankly, I'm most excited about is this new partnership with our um, local hospitals and to um, work with the therapists um, and see how they see this um, as being an accessible tool. And specifically, they're seeing this as a transition, something they can do inside at inpatient therapy, but then they can give the family a bag of puzzle pieces to keep playing with at home and then have that continuing dialogue. Um, and then maybe even customize, change the words and have these pieces kind of evolve based on, on what's happening. Um, so yeah, so hopefully I'll, uh, over the next couple of years, <laughs> this'll um, continue to grow and, and, um, and evolve. Um, but I have to say the last two sessions with you, this has been great because the putting the question as a central focus hasn't, hadn't been part of our discussions, but I think the, the guiding questions are, are gonna be key. That's wonderful. This is just fascinating, this process. And it is such a privilege to be a part of this process, you know, design process of this major museum. And you're talking about these ideas and you're sharing your, these ideas and the, uh, you know, how you think and how you prepare and putting one of these you know, amazing exhibitions together. So it is truly a privilege. And I'm so glad that, you know, we are having these sessions recorded for future use. So I'm sure they'll uh, benefit many. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time uh, to uh, have the session and, uh, and uh, for your participation in the summit. Uh, really looking forward to uh, more conversations and collaboration. You know, let, let's keep in touch, definitely. Yes, thank you. thank you so much. And thank you, Greg, for facilitating this. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Anne, it was lovely. Thank you. So I think, hmm.
Okay, Greg, it's on you. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And we will conclude today's workshop with a, a reminder to please uh, take a moment to provide some feedback using the survey link that I pasted into the chat box. And also a reminder that we have other workshops coming up this week, starting tomorrow. And of course, the three-day summit starts on Wednesday morning here on the East Coast. So we hope that you all are looking forward to that as much as I know we are. With that, thank you very much for spending your time with us today, and we'll see you later this week.